rest of the world, connect with the continent any day, and after meeting the world out there, be home in time for dinner with those you love. Collect your children from people you know and trust. Share precious time together. Experience and lay hands on the knowledge needed for the future. Make magic, make new well-being, make experiences, make heart room, make people, happy people. Make them so that they have faith in the future and the present. The small steps and the big steps for technology, for livelihoods, for the environment and for those who live here. Yes, our livelihoods. Throughout the ages, the sea has given us food for our tables. It still does and will continue to do so in the future. Art and culture have also given us food for the heart and mind. And the sea, the arts and culture will nourish our hearts in the future. Or the present. Because here, the future started long ago. Just as our forefathers in the time of sailing ships, it's in our genes to set sail. Explore the sea, the world, find our way, out. And set sail together, every man on deck. Roll up your sleeves and pull together, whether you're a fisherman or decision maker, scientist or shop worker. And when the wind fills the sails and the course is set, life feels like a dream. Everyone singing, smiling, cheering, big and small. Yes, especially the small. They must come first, supported by a steady hand at the helm. Out, out into the world, not because we want to leave, but because the world needs us. Because what we create together is what the world needs. That's why we create. That's why we share. That's why we share our experiences and we share the peace afterwards together. On behalf of Kristiansand Municipality, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming you all to this webinar co-hosted by the city. Special welcome to our distinguished guests, speakers and participants in South Africa. Kristiansand is Norway's fifth largest city, with a university of 13,000 students, whereof 59% are women, and citizens from more than 160 countries, we are truly an international-oriented city. We have long traditions in international trade, since the city where it was established in 1641 by the King of Denmark. We like to call ourselves a creative city with ambitions. We have strong and international competent oil and gas clusters. We have leading technology companies and we are one of Norway's largest export regions. We are a vital city of culture and a destination for recreation and natural experience. I would really love to invite you all to visit and experience this for yourselves as soon as the pandemic passes. The topic of this webinar is of great importance to the world today. Kristiansand every year have an event called City for All. During a whole week, we focus on the diversity of people in our city. Every group presents events representing their identity. With more than 110 events, we address and discover our diversity in a respectful way, focusing on equality and inclusion. Our political system is democratic and we are striving for equality also when it comes to women in leadership. 
In Norway, we see an increasing number of women in leading position. Our city council have adopted a strategy for equality, inclusion and diversity. It is essential for us and we strive to be better every day. We call the strategy It's All About People. The plan point out common directions for how the municipality can work to increase equality in the exercise of its tasks and roles so that the city can become a good place to live for everyone. All citizens, regardless of gender, ethnic or religion ba religious background, functional ability or sexual orientation, gender expression or gender identity, should have the same opportunities to participate in our society. They should also have the same access to the quality of service of a municipality. The respect for democracy, human rights and fundamental values has come under pressure in many countries. The corona crisis added to this situation. The European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of human rights are cornerstones of trust and confidence for our citizens in uncertain times. The Council of Europe is committed to defending and upholding the Convention and the Court. In this connection, the Council of Europe has stressed the importance also of local initiatives to support and respect human rights. The city of Kristiansand decided to take on this responsibility. On the occasion of the 17th anniversary of European Convention of Human Rights, the city of Kristiansand organized an international conference to celebrate and draw attention to the importance of the Convention and the Court. The conference will take place on the European Day, 5th of May, and we will host the European Conference each year with a few in the future with a focus on democracy, human rights and freedom of speech. We will also continue to work with Arkiva for future conferences. Dear international friends, 12th of March this year the world changed. We went from an analog to a digital communication. The pandemic took lives of many and limited our activity, activities substantially. During these difficult months, we also see more gender-based violence and worldwide unrest. I trust you will gather more knowledge on these topics during this webinar. I wish you again welcome and trust that you will visit Christian Sun in person one day. We will certainly welcome you with open arms. Until then, I urge you to stay safe wherever you are. Thank you for the attention. Your Excellencies, distinguished contributors in this webinar, dear all and everyone following us around the world. On behalf of South African Norwegian Association, the University of Agder, University of Western Cape, it's a great pleasure for me as director of this place to welcome you all to Arkiva. Or the Archive Peace and Human Rights Center here in Kristiansand. Welcome as far as Arkiva is the physical studio and the digital hub of this important conference. May the technique be with us. We are now in the conference hall in a building opened February two years ago. The building next to us is the main historical building at this center. During the Second World War, this old historical building was a Gestapo headquarter. More than 3,000 persons were imprisoned and many of them were tortured. In the basement, there is a tor torture chamber. In this room, visitors are told the history of Henriette Bie Lorentzen. She was arrested because she and her husband were members of a resistance group. Henriette was tortured in the torture chamber, although being pregnant. The German doctor told the inter interrogators how to beat her 
without losing her child. Yearly, more than 5,000 school pupils vi visit this torture chamber and the exhibition Focal Point Archive. They learn about our war history and how people reacted and acted during the time of occupation. And we can group the population's reactions on the Nazi regime in three. Resistance, adaption, or active cooperation. The main question we discuss with the school classes is, can we, or in what way, can we learn from history facing today's challenges? COVID-19 is a global challenge. Today's focus is threefold. Gender-based violence, gender equality, and women in leadership. Threefold. Each of them is important. And even more important, in my view, is how they together form a unity and relate to each other. I look forward to listen to all the different aspects which will be present presented today. I think and I hope I will learn something about how we as individuals and as societies not only can but really have to act facing COVID-19 in a threefold way. Adapt to something, actively, actively cooperate on other things, and in some topics we have to stand together as a resistance movement. Heartily welcome to this conference. A very good morning to your excellencies, distinguished speakers and participants. My name is Sanjay Maharaj and I am the CEO of the South African Norwegian Association, also known as SANA. On behalf of our team at SANA and our chairman, Professor Mdwabe, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar co-hosted by SANA, Akivet, and the Christian San Municipality. Today's partnered webinar falls under SANA's education program, where we seek to increase and promote academic and research cooperation in addition to student exchange programs between universities in Norway and universities in South Africa. In this regard, I am pleased that amongst our excellencies and distinguished speakers today, we have the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape, Professor Vivian Lewok, Rector from the University of Agda, Professor Suniva Wittaker, Professor Anna Rien from the Sociology Department at the University of Agda, and Ms. Laratu Mbele, who is a member of the Council of the Board of Directors at the University of Cape Town. I'm certain that universities will be an important role player in leading the change when it comes to tackling the scourge of gender-based violence, gender equality, and women in leadership in the context of COVID-19. Gender inequality has become the obstruction that confronts women globally in regard to income, employment, education, violence, and positions of leadership. COVID-19 is a pandemic that magnified already pre-existing inequalities and challenges faced by women and girls, and it is up to good leadership to ensure that the years of progress made for women do not perish. Just as we all want to reset the button when it comes to climate change during a post-COVID-19 recovery, let us all make a generational undertaking to girls and women, and let's reset the button by saying no to gender-based violence and no to gender inequalities. To quote Melinda Gates, we need economic systems that work for girls and women, not against them. We need more women in decision-making roles on education and policies. To quote the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, we need to start work now so women's rights are at the forefront of recovery. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think now that we all understand that we are very welcome here to this webinar hosted in Kristiansand by SANA and Arkive, together with the, the municipality of Kristiansand, that they all welcome us, and cooperating with the University of Agder and the uh, uh, Western Cape University, University of Western Cape. Uh, my name is Torbjörn Urfjell, uh, and I am one of those that have been dealing with uh, uh, gender equality in different roles uh, throughout 25 years. And now my role is to be 
the director of uh, culture and citizen dialogue in the municipality of Kristiansand. And I am going to be the moderator of this webinar. And I'm really looking forward to this, where we're going to uh, uh, talk about uh, tackling gender-based violence, gender equality, and women in leadership. They are three very uh, important and difficult uh, tasks to deal with. And when you add COVID-19 to this, we will see and learn from people uh, what is happening and what is uh, the most uh, um, difficult things to tackle when it comes to that. I expect to be an older and absolutely wiser person after these two hours uh, of the webinar here today. Uh, we are going to uh, be here in Kristiansand, we are going to go to Oslo, we are moving on to Pretoria, to Johannesburg, to London and Copenhagen, and we will all meet here at this webinar, and I'm looking forward to the following uh, two hours. And after these welcoming addresses, I'm really happy that we uh, are able to listen to our first speaker that is actually responsible for lots of these issues in, in the government of Norway. And I think that we uh, have all technique with us and that it's now possible for us to hear our Minister of Culture and Equality in Norway, Mr. Abid Raja, are you with us? Raja, I think we have this classical question. Have you muted? I think we have a classical situation. It's not <laughs> muted. <laughs> Mr. Abid Raja, this is, this is slightly embarrassing for us because we cannot hear you. And I know that you are a very good communicator. So maybe you could write your uh, message on notes uh, to the world today. I'm not sure. But we'll let the techniques look a little bit into this for some seconds. One minute. We'll wait for that, uh, Minister Raja. What we experience here is very classical these days during uh, COVID-19. It has to do with techniques. And I'm a little bit... Um, I wonder if we should move on to Pretoria. We, Mr. Raja said that we should uh, wait for one minute. I cannot tap dance or anything. But while we're sitting here waiting for the techniques to um, be where it should be, you know that you heard this SANA and Archive webinar concerning how to tackle gender-based violence, gender equality, and women in leader leadership in the context of COVID-19. Okay, I think we are moving on, and we try to get back to uh, Minister Raja if he still is able to uh, talk to us uh, later. So we are moving on to Pretoria. I see that we have you with us, uh, 
uh, our ambassador, Norwegian ambassador to uh, South Africa and the surrounding countries, as well as the SADC. Astrid Helle, you're there from Pretoria? Absolutely. Do you hear me? We hear you, and it's good to see you again, uh, Astrid. We're looking forward to hear from you. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to uh, uh, first thank you all. And now, of course, I hope I'm not taking uh, the time of the minister because uh, I'm supposed to speak after him. But uh, uh, if, if you wish so, I can start now. Yes, Should please, Astrid. Okay, very good. Now, thank you very much for inviting uh, me to this very important uh, webinar. Uh, and very timely. Uh, thank you to the municipality of Kristiansand, to Arkiv and to Sana. Uh, and very honored also to have uh, the minister, but also uh, to have the participation of the uh, survivor of gender-based violence, because they are uh, usually the ones giving us the most important advice, and also to have artists and the other participants. So thank you very much for this. Uh, it's uh, very challenging and interesting what you have given us as task to, to address so important issues in such a short time. Uh, but uh, I will try. On the issue of uh, gender-based violence uh, that you have put uh, first and foremost, uh, it is uh, first and foremost, it's a manifestation of historical inequality between men and women. Uh, and it is a structural problem, it is a discrimination issue, and it's a human rights challenge. But it has also extremely important consequences uh, for, of course, the victims themselves, but also for the societies in which this violence is carried out. It has consequences for the families, for the children who grow up and see violence as an answer to uh, challenges in the world, and to the lack of possibility for women to be empowered and also to contribute to the society. And in a situation uh, in the post-COVID, but also during the COVID crisis, where the economic hardship will be very hard, uh, the UN, uh, we just talked with today, uh, as, is assessing that the social economic impact uh, for the time being for South Africa is that 34% uh, of the middle class will fall into poverty. Uh, on gender-based violence, I would like to thank the mayor for underlining the importance of the European Convention on Human Rights. And that goes also for the UN conventions, of course. We need first and foremost, we need a legal basis for our work. I would like to also underline the political will. And that I'm very glad to note, but both in Norway and in South Africa, the political will to address gender inequality and violence against women is highlighted frequently and very, very uh, importantly in all occasions. Uh, thirdly, uh, the importance of uh, what Sana has said about working between university and research institutions. If we do not have knowledge, if we do not know how many uh, women are uh, victims of gender-based violence and femicide. Uh, and we, if we do not ho know who are the perpetrators, then we will not be sensitive to take action, and we will not know how to take action when we are sensitized. So the three Ps that uh, are commonly highlighted for addressing the search of uh, gender-based violence is first and foremost is prevention, uh, second is the protection of women. Uh, third, <coughs> so, sorry, is the prosecution of perpetrator. This is to a large uh, extent a, a crime committed in total impunity, in particular when it comes to domestic violence. Uh, and then uh, the fourth P is the uh, necessity for integrated policies, because it's a hugely uh, complex problem that can only be addressed at national and international uh, level when we look at it in an uh, integrated way. And of course, uh, to have action, we also need funding. Uh, and I'm glad to note that uh, we have just signed today also an additional agreement with uh, the UN and the UN Women in South Africa uh, in order to address the specific impact 
for women and the specific consequences of COVID-19 for the search in violence against women and femicide uh, as a result of the current pandemic. And one of these manifestations is, was highlighted also by the UN, which is uh, a phenomenon that is usually not uh, frequent in uh, South Africa, but has now increased, unfortunately, is the issue of forced marriage and the selling of young girls by the families to human trafficking uh, because of the hardship uh, felt by all. Uh, on the issue of uh, gender uh, uh, inequality, I, I would like to uh, allow myself to, to highlight the fact that Norway has an action plan uh, for, of course, we have a national one, but we also have one uh, when it comes to uh, addressing gender equality and empowerment of women in Norway's foreign policy and in Norway's development cooperation. In that action plan, we have uh, the main issues that are five uh, five issues that we try to address in our cooperation and in the case of south africa of course together with the south african authorities and uh, civil society organization the first is to have an inclusive education for women and girls for all uh, girls and boys the second and, and that's an issue also uh, when we look at economic hardship after a pandemic like the one that we have. If we send one of our children to school, should that be the girl or the boy? So very often the choice of uh, families will be that what, uh, the girls have to stay at home and work and then we, we will invest uh, the in, the, in the education in the young boy. Uh, second is the women's participation and equal participation in political life. There, I'm very glad to know that both South Africa and Norway are very advanced countries. Uh, South Africa has a very important representation of women in government. I think it's almost uh, 50%. Uh, South Africa has also a very uh, important participation of women in parliament. I think it's a, one of the highest averages also internationally. And I would add also South Africa has very important feminist male political leaders, including President Ramaphosa. The third aspect of uh, gender equality is to ensure the full economic rights of women and equal opportunities for women to participate in the labor market. And as a consequence of the COVID-19 crisis and the pandemic and the economic hardship, we see that women are impacted much harder than men because they are much more represented in informal sectors that are now also the first victims of this pandemic. And uh, they are very often not entitled to then uh, also the unemployment benefits and to the benefits that are given to formal businesses uh, in a society uh, like South Africa. Then the fourth uh, element uh, that we have in our policy on gender equality and uh, empowerment in, of women in Norwegian foreign policy and development cooperation is the issue of gender-based violence that we have now also addressed, but also including harmful practices against girls. And the fifth, uh, which is very important, uh, and I'm glad to see also highly uh, prioritized in South Africa is the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights of girls and men. Uh, in the case also of South Africa, I must underline the importance of uh, women's rights in the constitution and in the human rights and in the legal standards. But there also, uh, it's very important in South Africa, like, like in Norway, that we have a vibrant civil society who hold government to account and ask for higher uh, standards, and I think also now very clearly for a higher cost for the perpetrators of gender-based violence. Uh, finally, the issue of women in leadership. Uh, I've underlined that uh, both South Africa and Norway have a considerable number of women in leadership, and I know that studies have been made uh, to see why it seems that a certain number of countries with women leaders have succeeded better than others in handling the pandemic. 
Uh, I uh, think it's a very interesting issue. Uh, and one of the issues we can do is, of course, to look at the individual uh, women leaders. Uh, but I think there is another very important aspect to this. It is that these women leaders do not come into a vacuum. Um, they are elected by a kind of society uh, that also opens up for women leaders. I think I would stop uh, there uh, and leave it also to the minister if he is ready now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Astri Helle. It was very interesting to listen to you, and uh, you talked about the rights, of course, and you also spoke to us about uh, how violating our rights are linked to the economic situation, and I'm looking forward to go into that discussion afterwards. But I think that we maybe have uh, handled some of the technical okay. uh, problems, <laughs> so that still Minister Abid Raja is with us in Oslo. Can you hear us, uh, Minister Raja? Yes, I can. Can can you hear me? Oh, now? we can hear you. <laughs> we are looking forward to to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, sorry for this uh, technology <laughs> issues here, but I think we are solved this now. Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, interesting and very important uh, webinar. Uh, we are in the midst of a global crisis uh, that demands swift action uh, from national governments all over the world. Uh, it is paramount that the measures uh, we take uh, reach everyone. Uh, they are in need of them. Uh, we must leave no one behind. That is why we must consider the measures uh, consequences on gender equality. Several of the measures we take uh, to combat the COVID-19 virus might have a particular large impact on women. The pandemic might be especially challenging for people who suffer uh, physically or psychologically abuse. Uh, Gender-based violence uh, and domestic violence uh, tend to worsen in time of crisis. Home isolation and economic concerns can increase conflict levels at home as well. The Norwegian government uh, has implemented, uh, we have implemented several uh, measures to mitigate. It is weekly statistics on uh, uh, reported cases uh, and provided the police uh, with guidelines. We have also uh, defined employees at crisis centers as uh, essential services personnel, uh, which means that they could send their children to school and kindergarten when they were closed uh, for others. We know also that uh, uh, women and uh, men work in uh, uh, different segments of the uh, labor market, and the measures uh, to combat COVID-19 impact uh, the segment differently. More women uh, than men uh, work in industries that have higher infection uh, exposure. For instance, uh, 8 uh, out of 10 uh, working in the healthcare in Norway are, are women. But uh, the absence due to illness increased more among men than women during the first months after the shutdown in March. Uh, we know that crises, they tend to reinforce uh, traditional gender roles. A survey in uh, Norway showed uh, that uh, when schools and kindergartens were closed, the increase uh, that increased uh, the care burden uh, fell actually uh, on on dis disproportionately on women. We also uh, need to pay attention uh, to discrimination uh, based on people's uh, age, uh, ethnicity, uh, or disabilities uh, during the pandemic. These are also the concerns of the new government. We have. Uh, conducted information campaigns uh, in several languages also to reach uh, to the immigration population uh, that does not speak Norwegian, uh, either not at all or, 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 or they don't uh, have the good enough skills in Norwegian. And we know also that the pandemic, as I said, hit people with disabilities uh, hard and different. Uh, some of them are at risk of severe illness and access to health services have been uh, when access to the health services have been restricted. So the Norwegian government is closely monitoring how gender equality is affected by the pandemic and the, and the measures against it. Uh, we will need even more information on how the pandemic affects gender equality, but also 
not just the domestic and gender-based violence to women, but also the situation for LGBTQI people, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, people with disabilities, and as I said, also elder people. So our equality policy is uh, very broad. Uh, but we also know that access to reliable data and statistics is necessary when designing measures to combat the, the pandemic. And the corona pandemic and its consequences uh, can uh, have a determinal and lasting effects on women's rights globally. Uh, I know that the, the UN uh, reports uh, an increased uh, gender-based violence during the pandemic. We know that unwanted uh, pregnancies, uh, maternal uh, mortality and harmful practices, practices like uh, child marriages uh, increase during crisis. And we are concerned uh, that women's sexual and reproductive rights, they will create as a consequence of uh, uh, COVID-19 as well. Norway is acti actively advocating gender equality internationally. We will keep on doing that. Uh, we will make sure to direct our attention to how the pandemic affects uh, women and girls uh, particularly hard. It is important that measures uh, in the global combat against the pandemic are gender sensitive. So uh, thank you all for the effort you all are putting in this uh, as well. Um, and uh, uh, I think all of us must do everything we can uh, to, uh, um, to, to make sure that we have equality for all, also during this pandemic, but also after the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Abid Raja. Thank you for your statements. We heard that you're saying that we should leave no one behind and thank you for your dedication to this uh, issue and for the address here today. We know that you have to run to the annual meeting with the cabinet uh, of ministers. So thank you very much for uh, uh, taking the time, even though we had some technical issues uh, here before your speech. Um, we are going to move on to uh, an activist and domestic violence survivor. She's also a board member of the SANA, the South African Norwegian um, um, uh, Friendship Association. And she's also in the Grasa Marshall Trust, the Samora Marshall uh, Documentation Center. And she's actually the founder of uh, uh, Kuluka Movement. We are moving on to Johannesburg now. Josina Marshall, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Looking forward to hear you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, um, Excellencies. And It sounds like we have a freeze here. Uh, sustaining the line, so I'm going to have to be brief. Um, I've heard um, the input from the other speakers, um, and I wanted to start by saying that uh, as a survivor of gender-based violence, as an activist in this area, it is imperative that all policies be based on the experiences of survivors of violence. We know that um, under COVID, there's been an We are only getting parts of your message, uh, Josina Marshall, and we would be so happy to hear all of your message. Uh, I think, actually, that we have to move on. Josina Marshall, do you hear me now? Yes, I do. I'm very sorry that we lost parts of your message, but we are now ready to listen to you some more seconds. Yes, so I was saying it's very important that we center our policies and our programs, of course, on survivors of violence because they have the knowledge to inform systems, to inform 
uh, policies and programs actually on the ground. We know that a number of women throughout the world do not report, viol uh, report the experiences of violence because of the inefficacies in the system. And that would go then from police centers, from medical centers, and it takes up to the judiciary. So that is my point of conversation today. Of course, when we then look at the issue of equality, it is something that in the world over, we also need to base and understand our cultural practices and all the other issues around, the, the, around culture. Because we see time and time again, also the impact of culture. It doesn't matter whether we've got policies or not, whether we've got laws or not, the impact on, of, of culture, the negative impact of culture on people's daily lives then actually um, impacts on whether people report, whether people don't report, whether women go to school, whether they don't go to school, and the kind of treatment that they receive in all the institutions. And of course, if we look at GBV, because that's what I'm really talking about today, GBV impacts then on women's leadership because women who are abused will have a very small likelihood of being able to stand in their families, number one, in their societies and in the countries. And so we need to... Josina Marshall. We heard your message loud and clear now for some time and also bringing up the question on cultural practices uh, that we're going to have to discuss later together with the legal rights and of course economic situations. I think that we are moving on to our ne next speaker. We're going to go to the business presenter for the BBC World Television. Ms. Lerato Mbele, are you with us? Yes, I am. You are with us. Thank you very much. Are you ready to uh, do your speech? Yes, as briefly as I've been requested, I'm going to try. Thank you very much. All right, so first and foremost, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation for me to participate in a really important and timely conversation around gender-based violence and gender equality in the world. Uh, because of the things that have been said um, previously, we have seen an increase and an escalation of gender-based violence in South Africa, for one, and more certainly across regions of the African continent in this time of COVID-19 and its ensuing lockdowns. Let me start off by saying uh, and trying to um, reiterate the point that Josina Michelle was making, that we can speak about statistics, policy, programs, but we haven't really got to the nub of the issue until we've spoken about the embedded and entrenched patriarchy in African societies. So I'm born and bred in South Africa. I'm born of the Zulu people. I'm very proud of it. But um, I come from a culture that really romanticizes and celebrates and honors male prowess, male authority. I come from a culture of Shaka Zulu, Senzangakona, Dingan, and these are strong men in history and they uh, imbue a sense of a man having to be strong. And those become the values we normalize in the culture, in the community, in the household. And I dare say something that is not just normalized culturally in parlance and folklore, but something that, that becomes so embedded that, it, that, that women internalize it as well. And we find many African women, myself included, my mother, started to rationalize the infractions and the bad behavior of men. So a simple thing, for instance, is we've got a huge alcoholism problem in South Africa. And I would say anecdotally, almost every South African family has an uncle or, or, or so who, who, who has an alcohol problem. But it's been so normalized in the family that you just kind of 
cook Christmas lunch and make sure that he's got a bottle. When he's drunk, we just go, oh, we know, you know what he's like. He's just, you know, he's just, just a little bit happy. So we've reached a point where we don't call a spade a spade. We, we mollycoddle problems. And now we're faced with a social ex uh, explosion of gender-based violence and, and we're not sure how to handle it. But more significantly, the normalization and the rationalization of male violence, toxic masculinity, it leads to victim blaming, where women are the ones who have to contain themselves, make sure that you don't provoke a man, make sure that you don't wear clothes that would um, entice a man. Just driving in this morning, the radio, Power FM, was uh, looking at a news report today in South Africa about the increased prevalence of um, teacher student rape. And somebody actually called in and said, but you know, the parents are blamed because look at how these young girls dress to go to school. It's, it's, it's bizarre. So the young girl must um, be mature enough to know that she needs to curb her behavior so as not to entice the behavior of a grown man, a man in authority and a man who should be protecting her the teacher. So until we talk about entrenched and embedded values of patriarchy, the normalization of toxic masculinity in our societies, I don't think any policy or program is going to help us. That's just from my perspective. The experts can tell us more. May I paint a picture for you as to the extent of the problem in South Africa? Gender-based violence in South Africa in the form of domestic abuse has been something we've lived with perennially. I myself am a daughter of a father who used to beat up a mother until my mother left that marriage. It is so normal that when we talk about it in common parlance, everybody's got a story to tell. If it's not themselves, it is their mother, it is their aunt, it is their sister. It's very normal, it's very general. The problem, however, is that it's become so normal that experts can't quite quantify the problem. I cannot give you a statistic on how bad the issue of domestic violence is in South Africa, but the phenomenon is so serious that it's actually being compared to war-torn countries and the kind of escalated violence you see in war-torn countries against women. That's how bad domestic violence is in South Africa. Rape. Anecdotally, people say um, every 40 seconds a woman is raped in South Africa. But um, EWN, Eyewitness News, looking at police reports, have come up with a number that every day in South Africa, 110 rapes are reported in South Africa, 110. Those are the reported rapes. We do not even know what the number would be when everybody comes forward. During the COVID crisis and lockdown, in the first three weeks of the lockdown, 120,000 distress calls were made to the police or various agencies of women who were either being physically or sexually abused in their homes, stuck with the perpetrator at home because of COVID-related lockdowns. Mm. Um, and I could go on. If I paint the picture in the rest of the African continent, where I work extensively for the BBC, Human Rights Watch says in Kenya, at least 45%, so nearly half of the female population in Kenya will have experienced some form of physical violence in their lifetime between the ages of 15 and 49. Almost half of the women in Kenya will have experienced some kind of violence. That's Human Rights Watch. The Social Research, Social Science Research Council called Kujenja Amani also comes up with some figures. In Rwanda, we are told that during the lockdown period, the police tasked with enforcing the lockdown also then extended their authority to rape women. And so they're sitting with those issues now of police in custody for rape when they were supposed to be enforcing a COVID-related lockdown. In Uganda, the police were told to clear the streets. They went in there with batons. They were on a rampage. They beat up street hawkers and traders trying to clear the streets so that they could enforce COVID lockdowns. But we know that the majority of people who are on the streets working as traders and hawkers are women. And so women were cleared off the streets, denied their livelihood, but it was done in the most violent fashion. In the same Uganda, there was a media report just recently of a policewoman who was fired from her job because the police uniform she wore was body hugging. She's got wide hips. And so she was sexually enticing to, um, to, to, to the general public. And this was something that was held, uh, that was addressed at the highest level by the police commissioner. So 
sexualizing women, weaponizing women, um, it, it's something that is so much the norm in our in our societies. We all know about the extensive issue of rape as a weapon of war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was something that at the time, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was constantly flagged up as a problem, and it continues to be a problem. But because the DRC is no longer foremost of mind in terms of news coverage, that story falls by the wayside. But those women in the Congo are still living that reality. And as the ambassador eloquently put, we're still dealing with issues that the United Nations has been trying to grapple with of child marriage, uh, child enforced marriage and female genital mutilation across regions of the African continent, issues that are prevalent in year 2020. So what am I saying? I'm saying women continue to see their bodies brutalized, weaponized, victimized for as long as culture does not change how men and women relate. For as long as we normalize um, men's anger and we victimize women for their sexuality, for as long as we keep on doing that, we're going to have this problem. What are my suggestions? Well, I'm not an expert to make suggestions, but it shows, empirically, evidence shows that one of the first things you need to do is empower women financially. Because we have a proverb here in Africa that when you educate a man, you educate an individual. But when you educate a woman, you educate a community. And the Women's um, World Banking Council in New York has evidence together with the African Development Bank that when financing is rolled out commercially or even through microloans or even through development financing, and you start to fund small businesses that are run by women, especially women who are in the informal sector. That money goes a long way to educating the next generation of the girl child and for giving a woman some kind of financial impetus so that she can stand up and say, I don't want to be in an abusive relationship, I'm going to leave. So unless a woman has some kind of financial security, um, she's always going to be on the back foot. And in Africa, that's a very important thing. In the corporate world, it's also quite important because we've already seen, even in my own organization, the BBC, gender pay parity is a real issue. When women come into the workplace at entry level, statistics show and prove that they will earn 25% less than a man. So this patriarchy is entrenched in the corporate world, in the informal sector, in the economy, and it's something that needs to be addressed if women are to come into their own. The second thing I think we need to do is also focus very much on the re-education of the man the mm. African man. And it starts at home with how we raise the boy child, how we conscientize the boy child, how we sensitize the boy child, not just to the equality of his sister or girl cousins, but to the dignity and the decency of women. We have to do that whilst we are also introducing policies that hold men accountable. You know, in South Africa, we've got a huge issue of child maintenance support, where men just simply abscond from their responsibilities. And the case files in the justice system go back a decade, we are told, where men have just been absolved of their responsibilities to be fathers. So these are some of the issues we have to tackle. Um, social media is a tool of the 21st century. And for as long as politicians don't tackle the issue adequately, the media doesn't cover the issue properly, Young men and women are going to talk about it and galvanize on social media. So in South Africa, we've seen since the very brutal rape and murder of a young UCT student, we've seen the uh, hashtag not in my name, hashtag am I next campaign, even hashtag men are trash. And so these start, these kinds of social media movements will eventually become some kind of an organic social movement, which is good because it will force us to have these very difficult conversations. But can we not just be talking and raging on social media and start to see and hear the voice of young people as is expressed in some of these hashtag movements and start to do some of the things that concern young people because the one thing about Africa is its demographic dividend. We are a young continent and these are the leaders of today, the leaders of tomorrow, the entrepreneurs of today and tomorrow, even the politicians of today and tomorrow. And if our leaders don't want to be disrupted, they'd better start listening to what young people are saying. And they're saying they're sick and tired of it. Hashtag men are trash. That is what young South Africans are saying on social media. They are done and they want some kind of accountability. And then finally, I think this is where we step in as the media. I'm happy to report that just this week, the new director general of the BBC announced the 50-50 
uh, gender program, which basically says that when you're watching BBC News domestically in Britain and World News where I work, by February or so of next year, you should have 50-50 representation, 50% 50 of reporters to be women, 50% of news anchors to be women, 50% of the coverage of stories to be about women. And they've actually introduced an algorithm to track that. It starts with leaders taking tangible steps to address the problem, recognizing that the world is 52% female and that representation is needed on the broadcast media, putting those voices and faces prominently forward because as uh, Tim Davey told us, uh, research shows that women, when, when women see other women and hear other women on media platforms doing things, be it Serena Williams as a black woman winning grand slams, it empowers a young woman to say, oh, I could take up tennis. When we see a Josina Michelle tell her story, I as a victim of domestic violence feel I now have the courage to say something. And when we see a female prime minister in Norway, then I stand up and think, wow, I can lead too. So the media has a role to play in 50-50 representation and I represent an organization that is committed to doing so. Thank you. Lerato Mbele, no doubt that your message came through very clearly. And sadly enough, you also gave uh, evidence to that uh, that those hashtags that you also uh, shared with us are, are, are right. So I'm looking forward to go into that also in the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much on your message, also building on what we could not hear from uh, Josina Marshall. Thank you so far. We're going to move on to uh, the university sector. And uh, I'm uh, tempted to call out and hear, uh, uh, can you hear me, President of University of Agder, Professor Sunniva Whittaker? And of course you can hear me because you're sitting right next to me. That's right. So yeah. Sunniva, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you uh, very much. You. <laughs> yes, well, excellencies and distinguished guests, it's been really interesting to listen to uh, to the speakers from South Africa and uh, it really uh, goes to show that we live in very different uh, worlds. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I come from a university where more than half of the students are female uh, and there is an equal balance of men and women uh, in leadership positions at our university. Um, the ambassador mentioned that in South Africa, when you have to choose between sending a boy or a girl to higher education, uh, you would tend to send the boy. Uh, it's interesting to note in Norway that uh, there are more female students at the national level as well than male students. Um, the previous speaker mentioned that when you educate a, a woman, you educate a whole community. But what we see in Norway is quite a paradox, is that uh, the uh, boys tend to stay behind in rural areas, whereas uh, the girls move out and move into the cities, leaving the boys behind. So these are very different, uh, very different realities. Um, I would also like to say that uh, the University of Agdad has uh, diversity as a very important part of its uh, academic culture. Uh, we have a center for uh, equality, uh, which is tasked with disseminating uh, knowledge about all types of uh, equality issues, not only between genders. And we uh, also have um, an international study program on uh, global development, which I would like to mention because this is tuition free also for international students. So if there are any, you know about any S African, S South African students who would be interested in coming to Norway, uh, just spread th uh, the, world, the word. Um, the deputy mayor mentioned that there are very many female leaders in Norway, but we do see that there is a difference between the public sector and the private sector, with much more leader, female leaders in the public sector than in the private sector. Um, yeah, it was very disturbing to hear about uh, gender-based violence, and uh, although these things do exist in Norway, it's at a much uh, smaller scale, uh, and I I'm not in a position to talk about this. My distinguished colleague, Anna Rien, will probably say a bit more about that. Uh, just to mention the social media, we have had our uh, Me Too uh, wave here in Norway as well, and they did uncover that there were quite a few um, sexist attitudes that we probably weren't so much aware of earlier. So um, I've been asked to talk about leadership, uh, f uh, women in leadership in uh, the COVID times. I would like to say that in Norway, there are 
different ways of becoming a female leader. Personally, I have been elected by my peers. Uh, I've been as an academic uh, leader for 17 years, and for 15 of those, I have acted uh, on behalf of my peers and been elected by, by them. Um, and a lot has been said here and other places about the need for female uh, leaders, and uh, it goes without saying that I definitely believe that people who exhibit leadership talent should be encouraged regardless of their gender. But um, I do not think that women are inherently better suited for leadership positions than men. Uh, recently, there have been a lot of articles about the uh, way countries have coped with the COVID situation, uh, and uh, attention has been brought to the fact that countries where the uh, heads of states are female have fared better than countries where men <laughs> uh, have been in leadership positions. But I think we should be very careful when it comes to claiming any causal relationship between best practice and uh, gender. Uh, a case in point is the difference between Sweden and uh, and Norway, uh, similar countries, but their response to the COVID-19 outbreaks were very different. Mm. We know that the mortality rates in Sweden are considerably higher than in Norway. Uh, and although Sweden does have a male prime minister and Norway a female prime minister, I think this has very little bearing on the mortality rates. And uh, the difference lies, in fact, in the, f in the fact that uh, the decision to lock down the country uh, in Norway was a political decision, whereas in Sweden, these uh, decisions are made by domain experts, uh, in this case, immunolog immunologists. And what the long-term health and economic d effects of these <coughs> decisions will be remain to be seen. It might actually turn out that the Swedish response was more beneficial than the Norwegian one in the long run. So my point is just that it's easy to jump to conclusions that gender uh, explains it all. Uh, and we are, in fact, talking about a fairly limited number of countries. But I do believe that a country that makes use of its entire res human resource pool stands a better chance of succeeding than countries where half the population is excluded from important decision-making bodies. In my view, equal opportunities when it comes to education for boys and girls, for rich and poor, uh, and equal access to the labor market are the key success factors when it comes to developing good leaders. In other words, countries where women stand an equal chance of becoming leaders will fare better than countries where women are not given access to power. And I would also like to add that, in my view, men and women do not necessarily have different leadership styles. Leadership styles tend to be culturally congruent. What is considered good leadership in one country may not work in another. Leaders who have worked in different countries have ex often experienced this the hard way. Uh, a research colleague of mine from the Norwegian School of Economics wrote her thesis on Norwegian leadership and found that it does not travel well. Uh, her study demonstrates that Norwegian leadership is characterized by close relationships based on equality between leaders and employees respecting employees' competencies and abilities, and having expectations when it comes to employees' ability to develop their competencies through trial and error. In countries where employees are used to a more autocratic leadership style, a typically Norwegian leader, male or female, would probably be considered weak and incompetent. So my point is that when it comes to finding role models, uh, we have to look at the local context, the national context. We cannot export uh, leadership styles from one country to another because these will obviously be a part of a whole system where things uh, have to be seen in a more holistic uh, perspective. So um, those were the thoughts that I wanted to share with you here today mm -hmm. and I look forward to uh, the rest of the uh, of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, um, Suniva Wittaker. Uh, I think that uh, as a bureaucrat, it's of course sad to hear that uh, leaving decisions to people like us would have a uh, negative impact on life and death. Mm. But I think that you had very valid points on uh, the importance of leadership and also uh, seeing uh, leadership I in as part of the population that you're actually there to lead. Mm. I think that I will, uh, you already mentioned uh, your colleague, Professor Anne Ryun. I think I will invite her up to share the sofa here with you, uh, because we're also going to hear from, uh, from Anne, as you, as you already mentioned. Please, uh, Anne Ryun. 
um, professor at the University of Agder of sociology. Um, we are looking forward to listen to your message as well. Thank you very much. Dear all, first of all, congratulations to Mr. Sanjay for organizing this and thank you for the invitation. Um, I will talk as a researcher that has been uh, engaged in studies on femicide. Femicide is generally um, defined to involve intentional murder of women because they are women. Though it takes different forms in different regions of the world. Um, to illustrate, according to the World Health Organization, there are more than 5,000 murders in the name of honor each year worldwide, more so in some regions than in others. To the Nordic countries, this is an unfamiliar frame. But that doesn't rule out that we don't have femicide or intimate um, partner violence and our shelters are filled up. It's just that we talk about things in different ways and it works in different ways. Um, the um, honor killings are often committed with impunity owing to widespread acceptance of the practice and legal and judicial statutes that protect the murderer despite social activism to fight the practice. Important, women are not uh, beaten or killed at system level, but system level may perpetuate such violation by legitimating it and by victims themselves looking for coping mechanisms that make her surrender to religion and patriarchal images, and they often overlap, of her place in the family. And Mbele highlighted this in a wonderful way. This makes us reflect on everyday matters that we simply take for granted, such that love means care, that motherhood is respected, that your family will protect you, and that the home is your safe castle, whatever it looks like. Mm. Women, as a universal category, cannot take these for granted, because love does kill, family kills, and if killed, she's most, most likely um, killed at home by someone she knows. And people die from COVID-19. Women may be killed by the policy to protect them from it. Being confined to their homes, as we know, puts their safety at risk. So I will raise three issues. One, how we na name things matters. Two, culture matters. And three, points two and uh, one and two take us to that. What about female leadership? Let's start with how we name things better. Let me ask, do we know what violence is? Or what a murder is? We will say, yes, we do. Let me respond, do we? <coughs> when someone stabs a woman to death in the street, it is filed as a murder. If a partner stabs the woman in the home, it gets filled in all kinds of ways. So it is not the act itself. It is how we come to see it that matters. And a journalist one commented, um, once commented that, what if the killing of women had been called terrorism? And by the way, why does manslaughter refer to all people? So words matter and words are social actions. They make us do things, they hold us back from doing things. Either we are neighbors, police, judges, social workers, or politicians. Words matter, they are powerful. At times they matter more than the law. They come with consequences because they wreck people, good for some, disastrous to others. Now, we tend to think of reality as something out there, and we treat it as a fact and make sense of it in terms of our experiences by what we call common sense knowledge or what we all know. It is this that makes it possible for us to categorize and to name things we experience. This uh, also makes it possible for us to see everyday world as familiar, as ordinary. We also use these categories to make sense of other people's actions, in addition to other people's motives and interests, like she deserved to get killed because she didn't obey. So reality is not out there. It's something we make into being by the way we talk about things, 
by how we interact with each other and not to mention how media talk about things. Also when it comes to ethnicity and race and violence. That makes us understand that this is intricately interwoven with power. So we construct social reality. This is also why we cannot take for granted that murder always is a relevant local category when a woman is being killed by a partner or by in-laws. And this is also why we have to find out how people do make sense of murders as a key to fight it and to political action. So illustrate. According to uh, WHO, in UK and Sweden, and probably Norway, I would know, research shows that social service and criminal justice systems have often characterized honor murders as cultural traditions rather than as extreme forms of violence against women. This attitude shows a general misunderstanding of the gender underpinnings of these crimes and led to inadequate legal and social protection for girls and women under such threats. However, in Norway, young immigrant first and second generation <coughs> women have voiced the problem of social control. And they've done some so loudly, also in books, that politicians and social workers have got it. To also illustrate culture variations, a study from Norway shows that three quarters of perpetrators and victims had previously contacted the police the health sector and other organizations. But since these organizations only had data on their own organization, they failed to see that clients had been looking for help for a long time. Their efforts disappeared in bureaucra bureaucratic procedures, such like confidential issues. But it also shows the trust Norwegians have in professional and public sectors. And it may indicate that intimate partner violence is more hidden in Norway and harder to document. So, point two, culture matters. But we should not accept that cultural practices are being used as excuses for making sense of things without dealing with it. It's time for point three. What about female leadership? In these corona times, we hear about intimate partner violence and um, femicide, but there are many words, uh, less actions. Uh, and a report from Norway argues there is an increase in homicide, uh, there's violence in the family, in times of economic recession, and COVID-19 is one. And United Nations report is a very increase in homicide in a lot of different countries like Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and an increase actually in femicide in the United Kingdom. So uh, I like to think that it does matter whether the leader is a man or a woman, but I will argue it is by far more complex. However, I will point to the fact that some countries do have a female pr prime minister and leaders, but I will insist that to explore the process behind this and the effects of how they got there is a far better way to understand uh, that these countries make a difference when it comes to gender issues. That is a more promising approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne Rien. I think also that you gave food for the discussion to follow up uh, afterwards. I think now that we are ready to have uh, a video message from South Africa. So uh, here it comes. Video. Wouldn't you like to explore a country where two worlds intersect, where first world infrastructure meets an emerging market, where diversity is celebrated through its people and its sectors? 
where one of the most powerful economies in Africa embraces new opportunities, where science and technology enjoy rapid advancement, a land where innovation creates a dynamic environment for growth. The world's leader in mining and minerals, with nearly 90% of all the platinum metals on Earth and around 41% of all the world's gold. Home to 11 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And with the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites in Africa. It is one of only two countries in the world to have hosted three different World Cups, where a market of almost 60 million people provide you with the perfect springboard to access a continent of 1.3 billion people. It's where the impossible is made possible. Welcome to South Africa, a land of endless possibilities, a truly inspiring country. Welcome to the future. Invest in South Africa. Powered by I think that that video was abrupted very uh, quick there, but uh, I think we got the message from South Africa, so thank you for that. We are moving on, and we have, uh, uh, are now going to a woman that has had uh, several uh, uh, positions in Norwegian governments uh, throughout the years. She is now uh, the UN Under Secretary, and she's also the Executive Director of the UN Ops. And we are going to Copenhagen, can you hear us, uh, Grete Faremo? Absolutely. Amazing. It's not that far over to Copenhagen from Kristiansand, but we are still not allowed to go there for some time. So it's good to see you online. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the invitation. I am so glad to join you. and. Uh, on this very important topic. And you know that uh, Stiftelsen Arkiv is very close to my heart, as it is to my hometown. And uh, I want to speak to you today on the topic of gender equality through the lens of infrastructure. Gender blind infrastructure can deprive women of the rights to education, work, and transport. And do you know that research done by Oxford University found that infrastructure affects 92% of the targets across all the 17 sustainable development goals. And still we see too few women in decision-making roles. And this of course impacts decisions and makes them more, as I said, gender blind. And I have to admit that this is my favorite topic, so I could also advise you to go and see my TED talk. But anyway, you mentioned my background in government. I've been working in development cooperation and also in the private sector in finance and technology. So when I now have been the last six years, uh, the uh, Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UNOPS, I felt it was the perfect match. Many of you may not have heard about UNOPS, we are a full member of the UN family and uh, our business model is still different. We implement projects, mainly infrastructure and procurement projects for a fee. So we combine the best of the UN uh, and the private sector. We try to be cost efficient, innovative to deliver these efficient solutions uh, that are more found in what I could uh, call consulting engineering in the private sector. But when you hear where we have our markets, you probably understand why we have this role in the UN. We have projects in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in South Sudan, Myanmar. You find us in many of the conflict-ridden, fragile and vulnerable areas across the world. And we know we impact decision makers through our cooperation, also in how they perceive quality infrastructure solutions. And therefore, we put gender aware solutions in the core of how we work together with them and with the communities we work in. 
And just to give you an example, we build feeder roads in Gambia. And from the start, we plan for gender balancing the number of jobs in the projects and also including, exam for example, single mothers uh, to be inclusive. And of course, this challenged the social fabric of the community. And uh, we had to work with local decision makers to mitigate the tensions, not only in the community, but also in the families. And now, lately, we hear that we are recognized by the government for what we do to provide stronger and more independent economic solutions also for female. And I could mention an example from Pakistan where we have provided buses for women only. Because lack of safe and secure public transport infrastructure severely affects women's access to education and work. And if you look at the numbers, Pakistan has a very low female participation in the workforce. And we know that women feel safer in properly lit areas. So we have applied simple solutions, installed solar panels in the bus stops to keep them well lit. And I could go on with these simple examples because we know they are important. And we know there are too few women in leadership roles and in these decision-making roles. So that's why I feel initiatives like today's conversation is so important. And coming back to poor infrastructure, we know that poor infrastructure also can worsen the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And why am I saying that? Because we know the informal economy employs many women. And that part of the economy is hit particularly hard. Many women have less job security and less access to social protection than men and are hit more by COVID. So the infrastructure in case is my point here. Inadequate infrastructure hits women and girls particularly hard. It discriminates against women when it does not take their needs into consideration. I mentioned the dark unlit roads. Why don't we build broader pavements? We know we have to push the prams. There may be family members in a wheelchair. Who does this design? Probably successful males driving cars. They didn't think about it. And I think also the time poverty. A lot of studies have been done about how much time women and girls use to fetch water. Actually, the time poverty also prevents them from following their dreams. So we have to think how involving more women into the decision making. And think about it already from design phase. We have to ensure that we don't continue designing for men by men. And uh, we have to make the infrastructure more inclusive, ensure that, as I said, simple things are taken care of, like proper light, good pavements, how we perceive that communities inc are inclusive for all. So that was my message today. I think it's so important that we think how to redress the balance in how we think inclusive infrastructure. Thank you very much, Grete Farmo, and thank you also for using your experience from government and private sector into the international cooperation. And I'm uh, getting so many notes for the oncoming discussions here. But we're going to move on. And uh, now we're going to London, where uh, she's based uh, the South African performance and word artist uh, Nina Ndwaba. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Looking forward Wonderful. to listen to you. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so I'll be speaking about gender-based violence, but I thought I would start uh, by reciting a poem I wrote. Um, and this piece is called Another Body Drops. Body counts of a sexual nature, you question my adventure because I haven't gone past 10. Then again, that doesn't matter. Your patter isn't holding my attention and I'm growing impatient by your misogynistic banter. I think it's time to leave. The clock strikes three and she can feel the cold resonate from his heartless corpse. She reaches for his arm, hoping to disarm, only to disarm him, to change the setting, to warm things up a little bit. Nothing more. His mouth connects with hers, but with such aggression, you could have sworn that he was starting a war. She's thinking, I don't want this, but three seconds more and then I will leave. You spit. Shit, this was not her wanting. She did not ask for this. Even if she was into it, things would be moving too quick. He then bites her lip. She begins to blame herself, thinking, this is it. You begin to unbutton her top. You didn't even ask. The devil inside reveals his mask. Consent never even entered this clinical setting. She blames herself for letting it get this far. She's thinking, why did I touch his arm? The answer has grown too familiar. She was more afraid of a battering than attempting to flatter and soften the demon inside. Is it too late to say stop? She's crying inside. He's, grip he's groping her breast now. Stop. He'll destroy the rest now. Stop. I don't want this. Stop. Her inside voice loudens, but he doesn't. Not for a moment, not for a second. Stop. Why do men only apologize for their manhood and their no good friends after the fact? Sorry, is it not a fact that she asked you to stop, but you know, you've got your boys back? Well, no. How could you possibly mean that when you did nothing to stop your friend from slapping her ass or placing his hand on the lowest part of her back? Does she need to cry for you to hear all our screams? These are the same dudes who grab my waist at a party and stare at me, sneering me right in the face as though I did something wrong. Sorry, did I snatch away the entitlement of you and your best friend when I looked at you and confronted you with my angry eyes? Instead of removing your hand, you thought it was better to hold my gaze. These same dudes look so amazed that this honey wasn't trying to attract any nasty bees with ashy knees. You niggas don't carry keys to your own, but you think you can own me? Please. Now annoyed, I muttered to the guy. Unmistakably as drunk as I do, I know you. You should have seen his face when he finally got the hint. Finally removing his hand. He deserved my backhand, but even as I sit and think this, I remember where I stand. What if I become another number in statistics? What if he hits me? What if he rapes me? What if he kills me? Who will stop him? I find myself counting all the ways, afraid to become another body to count. Because in this moment, I stop and I realize that four minutes have passed, which means I can be assured that another body has dropped. Thank you. So I... I was thinking about this this issue of gender-based violence and how this this poem really resonated for me when I wrote it last year after a really brutal death. And I wanted to kind of just speak a little bit about the different aspects of this poem and what they're trying to challenge or address. So Another Body Drops explores gender-based violence and rape culture in South Africa. It challenges ideas of consent and the lack of consent and the thin line between the lack of consent and rape culture. It addresses patriarchy and issues of men believing that they are no longer part of the conversation or that they've never been part of the conversation or in the solu or, or, or working towards a solution of how um, of how gender based violence can be reduced or the right punishment can be used towards, um, I guess, locking people up for, for committing such crimes. I think in South Africa, there's also a cultural component um, of men who believe that they're entitled to women's bodies and that they own um, their partners. I know that this is also kind of more of a global phenomena, but I realized just from my own kind of experience that there seems to be this notion that men are able to punish their partners or punish their wives. Um, Psychologically, I've looked at the different factors that that contribute to to these to these causes, and I think it becomes a vicious cycle within our society where young boys who have not had conversations or education around consent and who have witnessed abuse themselves and their families, alcoholism or have missing father figures, end up perpetuating the same kind of vicious cycle 
which continues and continues. And I think that this amalgamation of different factors is what is really an issue in South Africa. There's a conversation that needs to be had on a societal level, on a policy driven level and on a legal level. Um, and yeah, and I think that's just a continuing conversation that needs to be had across genders, um, across sexualities, across age groups, across cultures. Um, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for your poem and also your uh, comments on that. It seems like uh, we are going to go on to uh, uh, another expert here from uh, Arkive, Peace and Human Rights Center here in Kristiansand. I'm going to hear from uh, the project officer Solveig Hessa Svinto. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah. microphone. Should I just hold it like this? Yeah. Do you want me to yes, start nope. Yeah, please uh, take start with your first point so to get make everyone hear it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Again. Thank you so much for letting me take part in this important webinar among such outstanding speakers. So although Norway uh, is a country where equality in the society and between the sexes has been rated quite high. I do believe there is still a lot of work to be done within this field. Here at Archive Peace and Human Rights Center, we aim to promote an inclusive and equal society where all people can feel valued and free to be themselves. What I found through my work here is that in order to attain a society where everyone can feel included, everyone has to be given a voice and be heard. Therefore, uh, I work a lot with documenting personal stories from people with diverse backgrounds and identities. And I create neutral platform platforms for them so they can share their stories with each other, but also to the public. The dissemination of these stories are to educate and bring awareness on all the different identities that live amongst us here. So why am I using personal stories? <laughs> um, well, uh, that's because our identity is partly built up by many, many small stories. And each of these individual stories are part of a greater narrative, one that lays the foundation for our cultures and also our very existence. So it's so important that these larger narratives are not reduced to one single narrative in which we only have one way of understanding the world and also then consequently start fearing the other. So in order to reject such narratives, it's important that all people are giving a voice to express themselves and share their stories. And I do believe this is especially important for individuals who have been silenced and oppressed because of their identity. So now I am excited to show you a film about Archivit's new storytelling concept co called Be Heard. Uh, and this film will give a little glimpse of uh, how we work um, within the field of inclusion and diversity at Archive Peace and Human Rights Center. So enjoy, thank you very much. Every child loves their birthday. It's like one of the most amazing uh, days of the year. It's when you get all the attention for yourself. It's your day alone. I don't know if anyone has heard about this concept before, but there is at least a teller arrangement som går ut på att eh, de på scenen berättar samma självupplevda historia från sitt eget liv. En gång du mistet något som var viktigt för dig. It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what you have experienced. Everyone has a story to tell. 
here at Archive Business Human Rights Center, we have extensive experience with using personal stories. We have used, for example, time witnesses from the Second World War and their testimonies in order to enrich the already written history. We need these personal stories to be included within the greater narrative because they are telling something totally different than only facts. Det er egentlig en historie fra mitt liv som egner seg på scenen. Og da er svaret mitt at det kan være egentlig nesten alt mulig. Telling your own story is the most powerful tool you can really have in bringing people together. Because listening to someone telling their own personal story, I think it automatically brings like an openness in the people that are listening. It's something kind of holy, it's something uh, it's something very precious about your own story. Det er viktig at vi forteller historie fordi at jeg tror vi lærer veldig mye av hverandre. Særlig hvis man snakker om litt mer kontroversielle temaer eller når vi kommer fra ulike kulturer, så får man se på en måte mennesket bak alt det man eventuelt ser på nyhetene eller hører rundt der ute. For å se om det er noen som går gjennom og opplever dette. Det er ikke bare statistikk da. Jeg skjønner at jeg sikkert er litt nervøse, men det er veldig naturlig og et veldig godt tegn. Oh, I'm really, really nervous. It's the first time I'm um, uh, on a stage telling uh, such an intimate story. So here it goes. Och där endlig fick sakte, sagt vad jag förde. Så kom det ingenting tillbaka. Okay. Varför har vi kommit så långt upp för att gå ner igen? Mari, min adoptivfar, han var nazist. Jag var över 30 år för jag fick höra detta och jag spurte men mormor, varför har du inte fått ta detta för? Och idag jag är vaknat efter fotsinnen. Jag började och gråta. Jeg begynte å gråte fordi jeg ønsket i denne dagen bare mannen min. Og suddenly, en mann popper seg på denne skjønnen. En old, white, ugly mann. Og han begynte å snakke. Og han sa, «Mine venneske medlemmer på denne tiden, American and coalition forces are in the first stages to disarm Iraq, free its people, and defend the world from grave danger. He turned what was supposed to be my happy, joyful day of the year into a very sad memory filled with unluck. As a good friend of mine says, stories heal. <laughs> so I can close one book and open a chapter in a new one. I would like to ask you if you would like to marry me. Tusen takk for at dere kom. Jeg har lyst til at vi skal gi en stor applaus til alle fortellerne og at de også kommer opp på scenen. Dear everyone following uh, this webinar, I think we've been quite successful so far about uh, discussing tackling gender-based violence, gender equality and women in leadership in the context of COVID-19. 
some technical challenges, but the most important is that we are getting strong messages and that we are able to continue the discussion afterwards. And now we're going to find out whether it's possible to us to hear from the University of the Western Cape. Professor Vivian Lavac is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University. And are you with us, Vivian? Um, okay. My perspective yeah. will focus primarily on the gender equality part um, of women leadership and uh, focusing on COVID-19 okay. and maybe just a brief comment on our experience with GBV yeah. at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. This pandemic has had a very gendered impact. Um, personally, um, during the period of 1 February to the 31st of July, I had the two roles of having been acting rector at the university as well as my own role of, as vice rector academic at UWC. And I had to deal with the impact of COVID-19, not just on our academic project, but our entire university and our university community. And it became clear to me that women academics had to do so much more. They had to take their modules on totally online, not in the blended form that, uh, that we used before, but they also had the added responsibilities of things such as homeschooling, caring for their children, cooking, cleaning. Even in my case, I was cleaning my house for the last five months between March and October, um, in addition to having had to do two jobs. In his policy brief for higher education institutions in South Africa, looking at the massively unequal outcomes for women academics, Jonathan Jansen, who is a professor at uh, Stellenbosch University, reached the following eight findings. Firstly, that academic work has increased dramatically for women, both in terms of expansion, that's through additional activities, and intensification of work. Secondly, that working from home had a profoundly negative effect on women academic work. Their focus was mostly on teaching and as a result their research suffered. In the first place, within the working from home space, we, women academics saw themselves returning to traditional family roles, thereby increasing the pressure on women academic work. In the first place, the single most important pressure point was the presence of young children, especially demanding toddlers, and school-going children needing assistance with homework. In the sixth place, academic guilt seemed to be more prevalent in women, and so we take on additional duties. Women academics often become the nurturers, nurturing anxious students at all times of the day and i've seen it at our university how women would be communicating with um with students via whatsapp all hours of the day and in the final place the demands for academic performance remained at our universities in our quest for success successful completion of the academic year in my own role i realized that as a woman leader I needed to be decisive, agile, communicating with staff and students on a regular basis, unclear plans to be implemented, whilst being nurturing and taking responsibility for every one of our 25,000 students and staff. It was a huge responsibility, at times relentless, but a personal great opportunity for, for growth for myself. And so I asked myself two questions. What can one do to ease the gendered impact of COVID-19 in universities? And I want to posit maybe six strategies. Firstly, we need to realize that we do have a problem. Secondly, to find ways to assist women who are struggling most. Thirdly, to rethink deadlines for opportunities, for appointments, for probation, etc. Um, in the case of women that were indeed prejudiced. 
as always, in any crisis or non-crisis situation, to communicate and to communicate effectively and continuously. And this one is the one that I think is quite key in relation to women, to set up a digital etiquette. Um, in June, uh, we started, I, I actually asked our university community to not have meetings on Fridays because I was picking up the fatigue in our staff. And, um, and I realized that people were having Zoom and webinar fatigue besides the teaching, um, the online teaching that was happening. But I'm now of the opinion that we need to do more, that maybe we need to explore not even having meetings before nine o'clock in the morning and maybe beyond five o'clock in the evenings. And in the final place, um, I think we need to design a protocol for after hours communication, which pertain to students as well. Because in our case in South Africa, with the data deal that we've given our students, we would find that our students are mostly online at night because they have more data at night for, for um, using their devices to connect um, to, to the online learning. And that also had an impact on the, um, the kind of communication with, with our staff. Finally, possibly we need to investigate, I think at our university, that's what I would like to do, what the impact of the lockdown was on our women academics and how it correlates to the national study and then design specific interventions that will be suitable to the context of our university. I just want to briefly mention in the minute or so that I have left, that as for GBV, in August, I hosted a webinar on GBV during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as a theme. And we had women academics, people from civil society, non-governmental organizations, government, legal agencies, etc., as part of the panel. And what became very evident was that the way we sensed a scourge of GBV and femicide in South Africa, although it was very difficult to come to exact statistics. And part of the reason was that during hard lockdown, that there was either no reporting or under-reporting of the cases. And my objective with the webinar was to not only discuss GBV as a phenomenon, but to carefully think through what our academic and community engagement initiatives would be in relation to easing the effects and awareness around GBV femicide and I included violence against children. And currently I formed a reference group at UWC involving all researchers and teachers on the two themes of GBV and violence against children in South Africa. We are in the process of setting up a repository for all research in the area and looking also from my uh, one project at our curriculum transformation to include issues such as GBV, femicide, patriarchy in South Africa, and toxic masculinities. My own dream is that as UWC is, a, is the, that community engagement is so embedded in the DNA of UWC that we would eventually have a center for violence and peace studies that will not only seek to try and understand why violence is so endemic in South African society, but that we also work towards peace and understanding what a peaceful society would look like. And in this um, respect, I think this, it would be very necessary for us with our deep connection to our, um, to our communities to co-create knowledge with our communities. And I would be very pleased if we could partner with the University of Agda in this regard yeah. and uh, beyond this, um, because I do think that across uh, South Africa and, and Norway, we have much to learn from each other. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vivian Lavac at the University of Western Cape. We got your message about the need to cooperate and the specific invitation to the University of Agadir. And we also uh, heard you uh, uh, elaborating around the role of students in the work of reaching gender equality and also uh, uh, the emphasis to make everyone safe. So thank you very much. And now, throughout these couple of hours, I think that we have heard very many messages from, uh, from smart people uh, raising the questions on tackling gender-based violence, gender equality and women in leadership, and also elaborating on the uh, context of COVID-19. And we should continue elaborating a little bit in a, a small discussion here for some minutes. Uh, I have grouped my very many points 
into around three uh, things to deal with, and that is cultural practices, the economic situation, and also, of course, legal rights. And if you see the legislation of Norway and South Africa, not very different. We have uh, protection in the, in the legal system, in, in, uh, at least in the law book, uh, uh, m uh, that should keep everyone safe. And I don't think that the legislation between Norway and South Africa is, is that different, even though other countries maybe uh, uh, could uh, look to some of those legislations. But then it comes to reality. And many of the speakers today have uh, talked about uh, cultural practices. And I'm thinking, is the way of reacting really so different between men and women? We see the stories that women are reacting by reaching out to help in a situation, and men are reaching out for the bottle. <laughs> uh, and it made, of course, most men don't reach out for the bottle, and most men reach out to help. But the problem is that those that do the uh, misbehavior mostly are men. And what is it with men? What can we do? to make men stop creating problems. And I'm, re I'm, I'm giving this question to you, Anneryen, first. <laughs> and I, you have to give us the answer. If I could give it to you, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> I would be <laughs> way up. Um, to, put it, for to start off saying, it doesn't help us to have a president who legitimately can harass women. Because those men who we are talking about today will then say, well, if he can, then we can. And they do. So I think also you point to another issue that now it seems that we, we talk about all men and all women. We, I think we also should ask, if you say men go for the bottle, we should ask, mm. why do they? And we know after Soviet broke down, you can actually look at the demography and see how the number of men went down because of alcoholism. So um, I think if we should manage to move on, we need to work both with the women and with the position or the situations that opens up, make legitimate to doing these violate mm. actions. And it's not easily done, but we have to look at the informal processes and make sure they cannot settle and be used in the law, in the organizations. If Lerato Mbele is still with us, are you uh, um, Lerato Mbele from uh, BBC? Yes. I can see you at least. And I think you brought up uh, some stories from your experience around this question. And and can you help us find out whether men are so hopeless and that we need a new generation? Or is there a more systematic approach to this? Wow. So the caveat is that I'm a journalist and I have experienced gender violence as an individual and anecdotally from what society and people tell me in my work that I do. So the experts who are better placed to talk about the policy interventions are seated with you and they're also on the webinar. The only thing I can say is what I was trying to explain is that in South Africa, certainly, and in other parts of the African continent, the infractions of men have been normalized, for lack of a better word. Mm. It's The trauma is so embedded in us as society that we no longer give it a name. It's no longer a phenomenon. It's just normal. So how we raise the girl child is always to make her conscious of the fact that she's vulnerable to the vagaries of male behavior. And when a, a young man misbehaves, we dismiss it generally as testosterone. He's just being a boy. He's just naughty. So with generations of this normalization, we have now come to where we are, where our fathers brutalized our mothers, and now our brothers have become like our fathers. And yet, today is not the same world in which our mothers or grandmothers live. 
we are in a world where legislatively there is more equality as prescribed, enshrined in the law. We live in a world of um, employment equity as enshrined in the law. We live in the world of human dignity as enshrined in the law. So it is not a different world. And so we cannot keep having the undertones of a culture that have condoned excessive violence, sexualization, abuse, and the weaponization of men's anger against women in a world where the law tells us that we are all equal and that we have equal rights. So this issue is deeper than what the law or policy can, you know, can, can handle. It's about emasculation. It's about men not knowing how to deal with the empowerment of women and, and, and lashing out, as Nina referred to when, 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 she, when she said her post. It's about men not knowing how to manage their urges. And it's about women being so sick and tired of, of pacifying men that they are now responding. And that is why I mentioned the hashtag movement, because young women no longer know what to say when the law has failed them. And so these movements will exist in some form in the media or social media, but ultimately I believe they will grow into organic social movements, almost like the Arab Spring, things that really revolutionize society, which is good, but could there be another way to engage the issue? And perhaps the experts around us can help. Thank you very much. I, I think you're too modest to ask for help from the experts because uh, you call yourself a, a reporter, but uh, you sound to me very much like an expert yourself. But I think I will raise the last question to Astri Helle, the Norwegian ambassador to South Africa, if you're with us, uh, Astri, because uh, you have uh, been talking about, uh, uh, of course, the economic uh, situation for women and uh, that was very uh, important in your uh, in your speech and you know the situation in Norway and you know the situation in South Africa so can you please say a little bit about uh, or around uh, what comes first what leads to what is it uh, economic empowerment leading to cultural change or is it cultural change that is going to open for more economic uh, a propor pro uh, right proportional re representation. Thank you for that very difficult question. Uh, I, uh, I think I will be uh, careful. Very often, uh, post total uh, over a long period. Maybe the current world is encouraging quicker uh, in particular because of the democratic of knowledge and of information uh, we have uh, very on uh, social media internet sometimes for good reason but it is also an export for information uh, and for mobilization in both in Norway and South Africa. Uh, and I hope uh, that also the use of technology can be a positive driver for cultural change in a positive way. However, uh, not all change goes in a positive direction. We have seen in certain countries in Europe. Uh, as well as in other parts of the world. Uh, in countries uh, with some democratic institutions and history are increasing uh, their pressure against women, against sexual and reproductive rights of women, and against the rights of women uh, with different sexual orientations and identity. So all changes are not in uh, a positive direction. Uh, we embrace positive 
uh, messages from the important uh, role models. And I must say, I was extremely uh, encouraged and impressed by uh, the uh, of the leader of uh, hundreds of millions of people in the Catholic community immediately uh, followed operation in certain Latin American countries the importance of following up. And South Africa uh, being an extraordinary model of the rights of uh, LGBTI uh, people for our minister. These are cultural changes. Sometimes they come from the ground and sometimes they come from the public. Uh, I think uh, on certain issues, uh, including the law, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. and the cultural impact. On the economic empowerment, sometimes it's due to a political will, sometimes it's due to economic necessity. Uh, the history in uh, Western Europe has been that a certain number of countries, uh, like France, had, because of the economic necessity and the consequences of uh, two world wars, to use women in all professions. So that was an accelerate uh, already after the first world war. Uh, in most uh, developing countries, it's not an issue of choice. All women are working. Uh, all women have to work. Uh, so, uh, in what kind of sectors do they work? Uh, are they recognized? Are they protected if they are unemployed? Uh, in the case of South Africa, if you get 500 billion uh, rands for a recovery, uh, does it only go to male owned formal sector or also to women hold? Uh, informal uh, activities. These are very important. Uh, mm. Just final, a little from the uh, both in Norway and in, uh, governments have talked about not return to normality of mm. the pandemic, but returning to a new normality. So I would encourage our uh, to reflect on what can that new normality look like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Astrid Helle, ambassador uh, from of Norway to South Africa. And our time is up. Uh, and I'm set here to conclude this discussion. And of course, it's impossible. Uh, and uh, it would also be very unfair if I was concluding it all uh, by myself. But in Norway, we very often like to quote uh, our previous prime minister and uh, world leader, Gro Harlem Brundtland, saying that everything is interlinked with everything. And we've heard that very clear today. We uh, know that we need to continue work uh, and see the um, links between uh, cultural practices, economic power, legal rights, political representation, and of course, leadership. Uh, and uh, that we need that to search for the new normal after we get out of this, at least this phase of COVID-19 that has been maybe prolonged longer than what we believed some months ago. Um, thank you everyone for, for partic participating in this webinar. Thank you for everyone uh, being out uh, uh, on, uh, on the web. And thank you very much to all speakers. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sana and uh, Sanjay Maharai, that is the leader of the South African Norwegian Association. Uh, we see that it's been a very, very good for us in Crystal Sand to have a glimpse out into the world uh, these days while we are stick stuck to the town that is of course beautiful, but we are, uh, it's good also to have the view outside in the world. Uh, thank you from uh, uh, Sana, from Arkive in cooperation with Kristiansand Municipality, University of Western Cape and University of Agder. And please continue the discussion wherever you are and also on the uh, ongoing web discussion uh, with the organizers. Thank you very much.